Hello, welcome to Linux Lads, episode 97. Uh, as usual, I'm joined by Mike, Amalith, and Connor. Say hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. This week, we are talking about just some cool software projects that we found recently and, you know, a little bit of news on some open source topics. So a nice chatty episode. No, no main topic this week because we haven't talked about like cool projects in a while. Before we go any further, just a quick shout out on our site. You can go to linuxlads.com forward slash contact. You can get all our contact details there. You can even get our individual Mastodon handles if you want to go do that. Anyway, let's get the show on the road. So first up, I wanted to shout out, this is probably something I've mentioned on the show before, but uh, Zettler, which is a Markdown editor, because I've been searching for kind of the perfect Markdown editor for a while, you know, that can contain all my thoughts and random ideas and stuff that I don't want to forget. Um, and I've been looking around a few, like I tried Joplin before, but the one drawback with Joplin, it was great, but the one drawback was that it would sync all of your Markdown files with these like gobbledygook names that only made sense within the application. And I just didn't like that because I wanted just like a database of Markdown files essentially. And I wanted to have the files be the names that I gave to them, not some random internal format name. So that kind of didn't work because I would like portability as well and to be able to open the files in other applications. So Joplin didn't really work there. Um, then I tried Obsidian, which isn't open source, but is amazing and is actually really good. and played around with a lot of the plugins and stuff and the data view plugin and stuff like that, which was really fun. It's kind of almost like a SQL sort of thing within your Markdown uh, document. So you can have like very dynamic templates and stuff that like auto generate stuff and take snippets from other documents and stuff like that. It's just really powerful and really fun. I've, I've used Obsidian. I've paid for the sync service. I've even paid for the publishing service that lets you sort of turn your notes into a uh, publicly accessible knowledge base, sort of. And it's really cool. I didn't realize it was not open source until you said it. No. I mean, they're kind of open source adjacent. They're one of those companies that, like, we're cool with open source, we're just not open source. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of sympathy towards us, but they just don't have an open source element to their stuff. Right. However, yeah, so Obsidian, I can't remember what it was that made me stop using it. I think it was just actually too overwhelming because I had a really cool setup there. I, I was using sync thing to sync all the files between different devices that actually worked really nicely. So it's like a cloud kind of storage, but with without having your actual your data on anyone else's computer, essentially. So it worked out really nicely. But uh, yeah, I think it just became a bit too overwhelming. There was so much stuff you could do with Obsidian that it just became a bit dense and a bit like overwhelming sometimes <laughs> so i needed something a little bit more simple so zettler is kind of scratches that itch it just like fits in it has some nice handy dandy features and nifty stuff you know if you want it but mostly it's just like hey this is a markdown editor you know you have your your vaults or your workspaces or whatever you want to call them like where you have where all your certain documents for a certain project live and you know that's all i need uh, I'll go to Amalith next. Uh, you've been trying out Next DNS, so tell us why it's wonderful. So Next DNS is a recursive DNS resolving service. Well, I don't know whether it's recursive or not, but it is a DNS resolver. So you make your account. It's like twenty dollars a year or something, and you can have unlimited devices and unlimited queries and unlimited profiles. And each profile allows you to configure like ad blocking stuff and malware blocking stuff. It's really simple to use. All of your devices using NextDNS as their resolver just simply won't resolve like Google Analytics domains, for example, or Facebook domains or Microsoft domains or any of that. uBlock Origin and similar extensions are definitely better in browsers for like cosmetic filtering to actually remove the ad element from the web page. But if you're like using apps on your phone, you can't exactly install uBlock Origin in your phone app. That's where NextDNS comes in. It just won't resolve those ad serving domains. It's like Pi-hole as a service, so you don't have to manage it yourself. But what those different profiles allow you to do is have different configurations for different devices. On your smartphone, if he's pointed at the DNS, it would work over both Wi-Fi and data. So when you're out and about, it would still do it. Mm -hmm. Going to go to Mike next. 
no laptop for two weeks and Endeavor OS works out of the box. So what's this all about? Yeah, I've been on holidays without a laptop, which doesn't happen often enough as it should. Uh, but it's a great experience just to switch off for a while. I mean, I still have my phone, but I use it only for if I need to look up something on Wikipedia or for, uh, you know, light things, really. Then I came back and uh, opened my laptop, and then this morning uh, my NVMe drive failed. Uh, So I scrambled before this recording to replace the NVMe drive with, with the original one, and install some distribution. So, so I set on uh, Endeavor OS with GNOME, and it works nicely actually. I like the installer. I li- I like the post-install kind of helper that turns up on your screen and lets you set up the mirrors and lets you, you know, all the all the configurations of Arch without having to look up how to do it. And you know, it's 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 basically. The discoverability is strong with uh, Endeavor OS. I haven't tried it for a while, and uh, I'm I'm liking it. They've recently uh, added the option to the installer to choose your your bootloader, uh, systemd bootloader or grab or none as well, if you want to provide your own. Uh, yeah, it looks it looks uh, pretty decent, and I got from computer that wouldn't boot uh, to uh, to a machine that I can record on uh, within two hours and that includes uh, unscrewing the whole thing and replacing the drive and install and download and everything so yeah pretty good nice yeah I, I'm running um, Endeavor OS as well and I really like it um, um, I've used some things uh, distros based on Arch before and um, I've always gone back to Endeavor OS Surprisingly enough, even though Manjaro touts th- themselves as something that's more stable than Arch, I actually found the well with my specific setup. So your your mileage may vary, but I've actually found it to be the opposite. That I found that Endeavor OS is way more stable than for me. My experience as well. In fact, when I took the old uh, NVMe that I use as a replacement. I found that there is a uh, Manjaro install from 2020, and when I tried to boot from it, I got the you know bootloader shell or whatever it is called. It didn't boot, so there clearly had been some issues back then on it as well. Needless to say, uh, Endeavor OS is stable if you do updates semi regularly, like every sub- couple of days or every week or so or something like that. But um, if you left um, Endeavor OS for several months. Your mileage may vary, so <laughs> there's a caveat on that. So as long as you're okay with updating, doing your updates at least once a week, then you should be fine. Yay! <laughs> Next up, um, so this is not so much like something I wanted to tell anybody else about, but I'm actually asking questions to you, dear listeners. So <laughs> we're getting our house done up at the moment, which is why we, I've been in and out over the last couple of weeks. But uh. I see a golden opportunity to finally have a networking cabinet underneath the stairs. So yeah, I'm just like, I'm going to ask all you fine gentlemen, what what, what, or anyone else listening who uh, has done something like this, who has lived in a house with like solid concrete walls and, uh, you know, Wi-Fi doesn't really penetrate as well as it could. Um, And, you know, how the hell do you get Ethernet around a place like that with like these completely solid concrete walls that have no like space uh, to put uh, cables in them in the in the middle. I mean, I'm not complaining. Those walls are nice, but yeah, it's a kind of a pain in the ass if you want to run like Ethernet anywhere in the house. So, answers on the back of a postcard if you have a similar situation. Have you tried uh, plugs? I already use them, but they don't always work well for me. Like they work okay, they they do the job, but like they severely limit like my uh, speed. Like I think it's like half of what it could be when I use the power line adapters. Mm-hmm. You could also do uh, mesh networking Ooh. is an option. It's not always a great option and it can be expensive, but it is an option. So you've got like your primary access point is right by your router and it broadcasts wireless signal. So then you put a mesh ac- a mesh point somewhere towards the edge of your regular access points range and mm. it sort of sort of rebroadcasts the signal yeah that's always sounded like a cool idea um yeah i just like the idea of it um that you can reach all the different nooks and crannies in your house 
Ubiquity is the big name, one of the big names in this space, but there's also TP-Link has an Omada product line, and their mesh points and access points and routers and switches and everything are much cheaper than Ubiquity's. It's not as wonderful an experience, but they're like half the price. <laughs> yeah, it's surprising how much these things cost. Like the power line adapters alone were like at least 50 or 60 euro. Oh, the, that was the okay. So you have the TP Link ones then. Yeah, uh, I used to, I used to sell these uh, in Maplin. I have because I had staff discounts. I have the Devolo ones, and I've had them for must have been almost ten years, and mm. they were all right. But uh, they were all right when my internet wasn't all that fast normally. I've never tried it actually because I don't need it now. I I don't I never tried it on like a stronger connection. If you want to, I can uh, you can have mine. I haven't used them in a while. So, hmm. And by that I mean years. So <laughs> uh, could be an option. Uh, I have two, yeah. But uh, we also used to sell mesh networking kits, and these were kits from like uh, I think either BT or uh, some big telco did uh, did like a big box, and that was about three hundred and fifty euros, just a, like three nodes, I think. Hmm. Yeah, it's either that or I get a masonry drill and start like putting holes in walls. <laughs> Next up. I'm going to go to you, Connor. We haven't spoken to you in a while. Um, I want you to tell us about this Mycroft story, actually, because this is something that passed us by and we didn't get to talk about it in recent weeks. Um, so what I've linked in the in the show notes here is a, a blog post from the CEO. My understanding of it is that a patent company or a company that had acquired a certain patent took Mycroft to court and then... They were caught up in that, legal fees, everything like that. So that was a drain on their financial resources. And then after a long time of being caught up in that, then they either the company that was taking them to court decided to drop it or they resolved it in some other way. But on the basis of that, the CEO is pretty pretty much saying, yeah, we, we've lost a crap ton of money to that Um that they're basically they've been drained which is a shame because um mycroft has been going on for quite a while i think um shane way back in the early episodes of this podcast you're quite excited about the mycroft project yeah. and the uh, the idea of it that a free and open source f uh, voice assistant so it's it is uh, it had a had a lot of potential and it's a shame to, to see that it might not be a viable project obviously it's free and open source so it's not so they're all of that is not wasted effort. It they, they it's still out there, but you know, um, a viable, um, viable company, a viable um, business model that they would be able to continue and be able to sustain themselves. It's a, it's a shame that they are not able to do that. Yeah, fuck patent trolls, basically. Um, because yeah, just like absolute parasites, they can all go jump off a bridge. As far as I'm concerned, um, like. Yeah, I hate that kind of thing. Like, when, but because that was a company I was really rooting for, um, and I really loved the idea of it. Like, I tried out the Mycroft One software on my PC. You could actually just install it, and just if you had a microphone and speakers, you could interact with it. And you know, it wasn't fantastic. It was fine. It was a voice assistant. It did what it was supposed to. Um, it didn't really do very many things though. Um, it didn't have a lot of integrations with stuff. So. You know, there was only so much you could do with it other than like set reminders or, you know, interact with a few select apps. Um, but yeah, it was quite limited at the time. Um, but yeah, as Connor said, they will have like the software and all the work out there in the public domain. So someone can build upon that. I remember cheering Mycroft on a lot when they announced that they were going to fight the, the patent trolls and throw all this money at them. And now I'm kind of regretting that because it's sort of at least according to these blog posts led to the death of mycroft and that sucks but there is another one to sort of keep an eye on it's called leon hmm. get leon.ai it's a an open source personal assistant hmm. i'm looking at it right now i haven't tried it I don't know what all it does. I don't know what all it's supposed to do eventually, but it's one to watch, I guess, if Mycroft is actually dying. So this project seems to, they only do the software, right? Yeah, they don't do any hardware. 
I mean, that could be cool. You could have like a company that just goes all in on developing the software and then releases maybe like a reference spec for a device that, you know, they have tested on or something. Um, it's like, hey, if you can create this device somehow and put it into a nice casing or whatever and make it look cool, then go ahead and make your own product with our software. Or just put it onto a Raspberry Pi and use it. I think that's, you could do that already with Mycroft. That was basically what Mycroft was, yeah. Um, I, I think that the brains of it were, but the brains of the Mycroft One device, I think, were was just a Raspberry Pi as well. Yeah, Pycroft. The thing that I can see here is that um, they, you know, when you something has to translate the text into speech, and the part that seems to be doing that, like you can choose your text to speech backend for Leon.ai, and they give you the following options. Google Cloud, AWS, IBM Watson, something that's a CMU file, I'm not sure what it is, and then Alibaba Cloud and Microsoft Azure coming soon. CMU Flight is an, if I remember correctly, an offline open source text-to-speech engine. All right, so that could... Yeah, sorry, I misread it. I, I'm looking at it on small screen. So I thought it said CMU file is a CMU mm -hmm. flight. But wasn't there a Mozilla text-to-speech uh, engine? That's what Mycroft is going to use. Open voice, maybe? Common voice or something? Or... Yeah, I think so, yeah. I think it was called Project Common Voice or something like that. Yeah, but there was a uh, that was an open source um, voice database, like voice models. It's not an actual engine. Yeah. It's just the training data. All oh, right. Okay, yeah. So I think we'll move on. Um, Amalath, uh, I'll go to you next. Abhorrent spam issues in XMPP. So for those that are unfamiliar, group chats in XMPP are called MUX, multi-user chats. And pretty much every muck I was in started getting like random users joining, sending an image, you ban them. And then 30 minutes later, an hour later, something like that, another one joins, posts an image or two, you ban them. And this goes on repeat everywhere for multiple days. And I'm not going to go into detail on the images, but they were disgusting. No one should ever have to see that. But... The one good thing that came out of this terrible situation is all of the XMPP server implementations and most of the clients, because of this, poured a lot of development effort into the clients and servers and whatnot to improve the moderation tooling, which is fantastic. Uh, Procity has a new module. It's a real-time blacklist. So a bunch of people are added to, are in members of a muck and they can interact with a bot in that muck to ban a Jabber ID or a handle. That Jabber ID gets added to this real-time blacklist, this central list of a bunch of stuff that should be banned everywhere. And then a whole bunch, all of the XMPP servers subscribed to this list immediately get that and ban it themselves, preemptively ban that ID. So one server operator sees this thing, they're like, okay, this should be banned. It's banned everywhere else too. Hmm. And some of the clients are also getting these abilities. So in Chiagram, for example, I can delete a message that someone else sent. Until recently, that wasn't a thing in XMPP, but it is now. So I can delete that message and then other people in the muck who have clients that support it, that message is removed for them as well. So what I wrote in the notes is this issue is propelling moderation tooling into 2015. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, d I decided not to read that bit out because it seemed like it was a punchline. <laughs> it, yeah, it is. Um, uh, like that, obviously, that, that sounds uh, good on paper, and I'm sure 99.9% .9 of server admins out there are on honorable and are, would not abuse the system, but you can just imagine that, let's say, uh, I'm, I have a personal vendetta against Amalith. He has done absolutely nothing wrong, but he literally just joined my server. And I go, "Hey, guys, you totally should uh, ban this guy's ID." And then he's banned everywhere. So it's it's potentially open to abuse. That that's why the real time blacklist group is not exactly private, but people are added with care. Mm. 
and there could be a, eventually there could be a like an appeal and uh, i mean if if basically i'd imagine that if this was to be happening often enough people would organize into a people would organize some way of appealing the decision yeah so far it's just been used for accounts sending these images it can be used for anything but that's all it's been used for so far nothing would be as good as being able to block uh, ip blocks well Banning based on IP is not effective, really, because there are VPNs and people behind NAT. So then you ban one NAT IP address, and then you've banned a whole group of people on the other side. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so basically people should stop being assholes. Yes, <laughs> that's, that is that's the a, solution. <laughs> it's a cleaner solution for sure. Um, I think we'll move on. Um, Connor, you have an interesting link in there. Uh, Katie and Noam join hands to add payments to Flathub. Yeah, so I came across this on Reddit. Essentially, it's the KD and GNOME projects, or GNOME projects, um, want to uh, collaborate on a payment structure for Flathub. So you can just imagine you can go into Flathub and maybe there's a suggested donation of $10 to this developer or something like that, um, like the way that the... Um, Elementary? Yeah, where they have a suggested cost and then you can just blank that out and say, no, zero. It's certainly a, a step in the right direction. I know that the, uh, as Amla said, the elementary OS people have been trying to do this for a while. It seems to have had a moderate amount of success, but within their own ecosystem. So I think this is a, a step in a larger direction of it being available for everyone, not just in the elementary um, store or whatever. Meanwhile... No, none of Ubuntu or its official flavors are going to be able to take advantage of that. By default. Yeah, by default. Because Canonical has disallowed snaps from all of them. <laughs> nope. <laughs> flat up. I, they, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah, they disallowed flat backs. Oh, I, no. I started that rumor. <laughs> <laughs> no, so what happened is that Ca Canonical, and who is supporting a lot of uh, you know their flavors with infrastructure and stuff, has decided that by default none of them, uh, none of them will be a, will be providing flatback functionality f out of the box. I. The wording on the post that will also be in the show notes was like, we all, I mean, we, the flavors, have all agreed to do this. I'm not going to go into, yeah, I don't know what's behind this, like, I'm not, but I, I can see why Canonical would do that. It is, there are two competing technologies. They like the one they make. They are also providing a lot of resources to, to flavors for, uh, for free, I'd imagine, and they want to propagate their technology. You know, it is. It might not be the best way to select the best technology, but it is. Uh, well, it is capitalism, I think. And the the ones of us, like me, for example, who really think well, I I like flatback better than snaps because that's where the most push is. I don't think I'm qualified to actually evaluate them technologically. But I can see it from the organizational part of point of view, where uh, basically the only one who's uh, promoting snaps is Canonical, and they are fun they are focusing on the server, uh, whereas uh, the big two desktop technologies and some other open and, and and a few big distros are basically cooperating together on flatbacks. So that tells me that as when it comes to containerized uh, application technology for desktop, I probably want to choose flatbacks because there's going to be more choice and more effort from more, many, more, many more places. Even after all, if Canonical gets bought in a, uh, in a month uh, and they decide that they need to cut off the desktop altogether, then we still have flatbacks, but we probably wouldn't have snaps Plus, it basically the whole ecosystem is more kind of uh, community driven and uh, more robust and resilient to my, uh, you know, naive uh, uh, enthusiast eyes. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I just say one thing: there is a, there was a lot of uh, crap being flung at uh, Canonical for this. I think they are perfectly within their rights to do this kind of thing, and uh, you know. It's, if 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 I don't like it, you can. There's a million other distros to choose than just Ubuntu or Ubuntu flavors. And if the flavors themselves don't like it, they can stop become flavors. Like you know, you have Mint and um, Elementary that are not official flavors, and that they can provide whichever technology they want to. And if you are on Ubuntu and want Flatback, you can always install it as well. The big thing I don't like about this is 
flat packs and snaps were both supposed to solve the problem of where one of the problems they were both supposed to solve was adding PPAs to Debian and getting like unofficial, unofficial software from other locations. But with Canonical basically disallowing flat packs from Ubuntu and all of its derivatives, the normal people that install Ubuntu or its derivatives are going to go want some piece of software and it's not going to be available in the Snap Store. And then they're, they're going to have to go drop to a command line and, and do this other stuff to enable FlatHub. While Canonical could just say, okay, they can coexist. We're not going to focus on Flatpak. We're going to put up a big warning saying, hey, this is unsupported, but we're going to let you do it anyway. This just kind of, I, th- I feel like this is a step back. It's 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 uh, VHS and Beta all over again, and it's um, Blu-ray and <laughs> HD DVD, and ultimately whichever the <laughs> b- the pornography industry ch- chooses is the one that's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> so will we'll porn choose flat pack or snaps? I wonder. <laughs> I I do understand Canonical's decision. It's it's perfectly within their rights to do all of this. I I just don't like it. Yeah, because the porn industry is well known for its open source well, projects. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that, you know, if you are porn happy, you probably run a lot of Linux, I'd imagine. Yeah, and I suppose, and given what they do, they probably have to, uh, you know, they probably can't have contracts with certain vendors. So, you know, because they, people just don't touch, like, that kind of thing. They're like, oh, no, not for me. A lot of in-house stuff. Yeah, they probably have a lot of in-house stuff that they have to come up <laughs> themselves. So you never know. It'll be f- <laughs> the Pornhub fun. GitHub. The Pornhub GitHub could be like really, really great if if it ever existed. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Oh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, okay? Uh, Let's just so move I, on. <laughs> I'm genu- I'm genuinely curious, though. Now that I think of it, I, I would actually love to hear something about like Pornhub software stack, or you know, just like I, I'd be very curious. I don't know why. Um. Anyway, yeah, I don't really know where to go with that. Uh, what next? What have we not talked about yet? Um, Mike, tell us about U.S. school buses. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's it is a tech, it is a piece of technology, right? So uh, as you gentlemen will be hearing from me for about half a year, I've been on holidays in the Caribbean. It was amazing. But one thing that I discovered is so I've never seen a U.S. school bus apart from on TV. You know, they are quite distinct. You can't tell, you can't mistake them for anything else. You know, they've got the nose and then the box at the end on the axle that is kind of almost in the middle. And as we were driving from the from the airport, being driven on a normal uh, normal coach, I'm like, oh my god, what is all of these school buses? And turns out that when they are retired from the U.S. school system, they are sold. Probably not the only place they are sold, to, but they are sold by and large to the to the to the Caribbean, where hotels and tourist organizations and so on buy them for private, you know, moving tourists around. Uh, Probably none of them actually end up shipping children around because the pork is there, have to walk. Uh, but I wondered why, and it turns out that that thing can climb a fucking mountain. Like, I, I wouldn't have believed that, right? But they took us uh, to actually to see a school uh, on, a, on, on, on one of these, and it was going almost upright. It was screaming it was uh, you know it was shaking and everything but it got us to a place where a normal bus probably would not be able to to even dream of going (laughs) yeah so you know sometimes old and reliable is best my truck is an antique as of this year do you get like a special license place and you don't have to pay tax or something yes oh awesome i get a special license plate and i never need another inspection what do you drive if you don't mind saying. A 92 pickup truck. Hmm. Hmm. So it's 31 years old. It's making everyone here feel old. The yeah. 92 is considered an antique. Yeah, that, that's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, in, in the US, or specifically in North Carolina, vehicles are considered vintage or antique or whatever after 30 years. I suppose that makes sense. Uh, I used to work in insurance, and how they do it here is you would have... Uh, you would have a, you would insure it as a classic vehicle, so it would be really small, small insurance, but there'd be a lot of like caveats attached to it. So you would have a limit on how much you could drive it every year, and literally you would be insured on driving it from where it was stored to 
the car show that you were showing it off at. <laughs> so it really was for like actual vintage cars like that you would show off at car shows and stuff. But you wouldn't have like 30 years old cars done that way here, would you? You could. It depends. I mean, it just depends. I think that, yeah, I think the threshold is a bit more than 30 years, though. Um I'm not sure though. I think it depends on the car. It's it's a it's a weird mental thing, but like needless to say, something from the seventies or something from the eighties is would ultimately qualify for that. But I, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, a, a vintage old classic car is like a Model T that goes around going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so in Ireland, everybody has new cars, partially because it's a rich country and partially because uh, it's surrounded by sea, so everything kind of uh, falls apart very quickly because of the rust. Never thought of it that way. Uh, where I'm from, my grandmother had a, a 19, early 1980s Skoda for, yeah, 30 years, I think. And that she wasn't alone. Even if you go back there, like you see cars that probably should be in a museum and are, and they keep them, yeah, they keep them for longer. And uh, I think in order for you to have an antique, uh, it would have to be basically pre-war or maybe from the 50s. Yeah, it's like here, like my car is 15 years old and uh, the tax on it is way higher than if it was a newer car. And also you have to get it like inspected every single year and uh, your insurance is going to be higher and stuff like, yeah, there's just like a lot of hidden costs to having an older car here. So it's actually more cost effective sometimes to just have a newer car because it's kind of cheaper to run. So, <laughs> yeah, they kind of just like strong arm you into buying a newer car. I think I have a, well, it's not a theory. I think it's pretty much well known fact is that like the motor industry have a big lobby in Ireland because so many people buy a car here. So they, 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 they just tweak the rules so people will always be buying new cars constantly. <laughs> that That's another thing. Kind of um, English speaking countries have uh, larger sprawling suburbs and uh, less efficient uh, public transportation, in my experience anyway. And I haven't been to the US, but I assume that's the case there too. So everybody has a car. It's abysmal here. Everybody needs a, you, you need kind of a car to move around. Yes. Yeah. And Dublin has, pub, like Dublin's public transport is relatively okay. I think people complain about it, but I think it's more or less fine. It's improving. It's definitely not on the level of like other cities I've been to for sure. Um, but it's getting there. Um, the, the Lewis is quite good. Um, where it's every 10 minutes, whereas to germ to a German, that will be in an absolute eternity. It's like, uh, t- my 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 transport is every four minutes. What what is this? It should be every two minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? Yeah, I went to Copenhagen and bus stop said like two minutes until the next bus, and all of them after was like three minutes, five minutes, six minutes. It was like there was literally a bus every two minutes, and I was like, and then it actually arrived in two minutes. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> Well, it, oh. I've never seen that before in Dublin. Yeah. The sign would say like two minutes, then three minutes, then four minutes, then back down to two, then three again, then one. And then it's then it just disappears off the sign and never arrives. That's the regular <laughs> thing. It would literally disappear off the sign. Uh, well, yeah, my exposure to very efficient transport was uh, the, the London Underground, the Tube. And I was like, mm. if something was that reliable and that dependable, oh, my life would completely and utterly change. So I was like, I, I definitely could get used to this, the whole thing of the London Underground being so efficient and so dependable. I was like, oh, so this is what transport is supposed to be like. <laughs> yeah, well, don't forget, Dublin will have its metro in just 10 to 12 years' time. <laughs> the first time I experienced good public transport was when we were in Prague. Oh, yikes. Yeah, but then again, I'm telling you, Prague is condensed people build up rather than to the sprawl. So, and mm-hmm. car people did, in the 60s and 70s, people were, if you wanted a car, you waited 10 years for that thing, right? I'm exaggerating, but you know, it wasn't like you can go and buy yourself a car easily. So public transport worked and it's easier to do if you have a condensed city. Uh, it's, it's difficult mm-hmm. if you have to have long lines that will pick up one person per kilometer. Uh, it gets more expensive as well. Yeah. It's like our public transport falls somewhere in between like a European capital and then like most cities in America, you know, (laughs) where it's like public transport. (laughs) Isn't that thing the poor people use? (laughs) It's it's beautiful. I don't know why people like driving so much because you can read on a public transport. You can do whatever you can. You kind of have no choice in America in some places, as far as I know. Yeah, there's just not public transport in most places or at least around where I live in most places. In the big cities, yeah, it does exist. And it's 
one of the best ways to get around. But America is just like so spread out. The cities are spread out, and everything within the city is also spread out. Hmm. Yeah. So getting anywhere pretty much requires a car. Okay. Unless you're in like a college town. Here we have a bus system, and at my apartment, the bus comes by every 15 minutes. But where I was last semester, it came by every 30 minutes. So if you if you miss the one right before your class, so, well, you're gonna miss class. Yeah. So I think uh, I think that's a good place to wrap things up. What do you think? I do want to talk about my last one, if that's all right. Okay. So Amalith, uh, you can wrap this up. I can't pronounce some of those things, so you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so for Jo and renovate and and woodpecker is an excellent combo. Forgeo is a fork of Gitti. Git, Gitti's uh, project leads decided they were going to make a for-profit company using the Gitti name and, and branding. And all of that would be fine, except they were not transparent at all about any of it. They just kind of published a blog post saying, hey, we're a company now, and a bunch of other stuff. And that scared a lot of people off. Codeberg and some Gitti contributors decided they were going to fork Git into Forgeo, and it's already been like set up with its own domain. I think it already has a nonprofit, and that nonprofit owns the the branding and the trademark and everything. So it's already, from a legal standpoint, been set up very well. What does it do? Forgeo and and Git and all that is a Git platform, like a self hosted GitHub sort of. And I've been using it for a while for personal stuff and for my business stuff. Recently, I discovered a tool called Renovate, which is like a self-hosted Dependabot. And Dependabot is a GitHub thing that scans through your project's dependencies and opens a pull request when any of your dependencies need to be updated. Renovate does the same thing, but it supports Git-T and by extension for Jo. So you don't have to worry about keeping on top of dependency updates because it lets you know. And it also, like, it injects the change log into the pull request. So you can open the pull request, see, hey, this stuff needs to be updated. This is the old version. This is the new version. This is what I'll change. These are the breaking changes. You click a button and it's merged. It's really simple, and I've, I've been loving it. Woodpecker is a CI CD system, sort of like GitHub Actions in a way. And it integrates with Forgeo on a very deep level. So the pull requests opened by Renovate to update your dependencies can trigger Woodpecker pipelines to do automated testing and building to make sure that dependency update doesn't break anything. And it also automates deploys and all that kind of stuff. The, this, the setup with these three components is the most self-hosted GitHub setup I've ever seen, and I've been using it extensively for my business the past couple of months. It's been great, and I highly recommend it. And all those components are open source. Nice. Well, it's actually a very good recommendation to go out on. Um, I think we're going to leave it there for this fortnight. When this goes out, this will probably have been delayed. So apologies. That's, you know, kind of my fault, I guess, because <laughs> of this blasted house renovation. And uh, yeah, that's just kind of throwing everything off. So uh, we should re return to a normal cadence within a few weeks. Um, we've got a very special episode lined up next time, so keep an eye out for that. We won't say what it is, just in case. But if you want to reach out to us, obviously, linuxlads.com forward slash contact. But the best way, the most sure, surefire way to get in touch with us is show at linuxlads.com. So send us an email. We read all the emails that we get. And yeah, always just the best, most direct way to send any feedback to the show or anything you want us to shout out. And we also have uh, a Ko-Fi. It's kind of like a Patreon. So you can go there and we have different tiers and stuff. You can sponsor us for a time or just give us like a one-off donation, whatever you fancy doing. So we're building up a really nice collection of links now. So it's kind of it's kind of unwieldy to re read them all out. So <laughs> just go to linuxlads.com forward slash contact and they'll all be there. Okay, I think that's us for this fortnight. And thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Adios. Wait. 
We we go from porn to U.S. school buses. Oh, I'm sure they've been used. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Jesus. We we all knew that that was an awkward segue, but we're going to run with it anyway. 